Um, it's lovely to see so many faces in the chamber today. Um, so, a brief introdu introduction. Grace Beverly is the founder and director of both Tala and BND, two brands which are quickly making their mark in the fitness and fashion industries. Tala was conceptualized with a dream of creating a fully sustainable and eth ethical athletic brand. The brand seeks to cater for the fashion forwards fighting for reconceptions of certain looks and styles for sustainability aware audiences. Tala is sold out within minutes of every restock since May, each selling tens of thousands of products, proving the need for a bridging of sustainable clothing and fast fashion. Grace is active in political discussions across all of her digital platforms. You'll often find her speaking on panels about entrepreneurship and sustainable fashion, and she recently appeared on BBC Politics to discuss abortion rights, veganism, and Brexit. Can everyone please give a warm round of applause for Grace Beverly? Right, so just to briefly introduce the format, we're going to start with a moderated interview just to get things going, and then I'm sure everyone in the room has a lot of questions for Grace, so then I'll open it out to the audience. Um, so first, I want to start, and I do this with all my speak speakers, is to start sort of at the beginning of your career. So um, what inspired you to, to start your Grace for UK, slash now Grace Beverly Instagram? Um, I think... Originally, it definitely wasn't a kind of conscious decision. I very much decided to start an Instagram as a sort of diary to um, try and get myself into fitness because I was so bad at going to the gym and I really, really wanted to be good at going to the gym because I used to be very sporty um, and I, I just couldn't stick to it at all. So I basically just decided that I'd start up an Instagram essentially to act as a diary and to kind of keep me accountable. Um, I feel like at the time... I very much didn't follow kind of any influences, as it were. If there were any influences, it would very much be kind of actors and models. It would, it, there, was, there were very few people who were in the space and kind of big in the space based on that alone. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously the industry has changed hugely since then, but it was very much a kind of decision just for myself. It wasn't, it wasn't to showcase my fitness at all because there was no fitness to showcase. Um, it was just <laughs> to kind of share my journey, essentially. And you say that um, the industry has changed a lot, and I think we can all sort of agree, because I can sort of think back to like the early days of Instagram, where it was just like your friends and whatever. Um, but I, this is something that you've made a lot of videos about, um, and I think a question that a lot of us have is, how does being an influencer work? Um, and I think also we've seen that because it's such a sort of new thing almost as a job, is that there's quite a lot of stigmas around it. Um, and sort of how do you work with those, and what would you say those stigmas are? Um... I think firstly in the way that the industry has changed and in how it works now. I mean, I think it works very differently for different types of influencers. I believe that the industry has kind of grown so much that now there very much isn't a set type of influencer. There isn't a person who, you know, you can predict everyone's income streams or you can look at the way they work with brands or whatever it might be. There are so many influencers who now have brands of their own. There are so many who promote lots of things that they potentially don't believe in, but there are also people who create incredible content for brands that is kind of above and beyond what a marketing agency might be able to produce um, and selling it in such a unique way. Um, I think in terms of the stigmas, I think it's definitely improved over the past kind of few years now that, well, now that brands are so kind of persuaded by the idea of the influencer. So now that brands are spending so much with influencers and influencer marketing, mm. people are becoming very aware of the fact that this is a legitimate job because they wouldn't be spending that much on it if it wasn't kind of going to work for them. So I think that has helped a lot. And I think also the rise in kind of really incredible creative influencers as well has very much helped for, if you say, look, I work in social media, people might not immediately kind of think okay she promotes teeth whitening products on a daily basis um and might instead think you know they might have a blog that was able to kind of promote to like a hundred thousand people or promote a really creative way of saying something or talk about mental health or whatever it might be so there's so many different angles now that it means that no one no one kind of fits in this one influencer box mm. um 
which I believe has made people a lot more open-minded to the idea and the kind of stigmas behind it. Yeah, I think it's like an interesting, almost like grassroots thing in the sense that I feel like a lot of people had interest in influencers that were on Instagram, so just regular people. And that obviously sort of had, like brands had to sort of catch on to that, even if, I don't know, the average like brand marketing type person, I'm really stereotyping here, but like some white man who's like 50 and it's just like, oh, I don't understand what, what, what this is. Like, why is everyone on, on Instagram? Um, but having to respond to that, it's like quite an interesting thing to think about, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very much, I think when, when I started out and especially I started seeing it as a job, some brands would be like, you know, here's some clothes or whatever. Can you post in it? And if you would actually go to a big brand, they'd be like, why on earth would we pay you? We put this on billboards. We put this on the TV. Um, and now obviously it has changed so much as an industry to a mm. point where it is so legitimized and actually marketing spent in other areas has just gone down so much in favor of this. Mm. And in terms of, so your personal sort of positioning yourself within with all of these offers from different brands um i think one thing that's really interesting for a lot of people is did you find it difficult in the beginning to balance out your own interests versus the the, the offers that you were getting from some brands so for example if a brand wasn't ethical or cruelty free or vegan did you do you ever turn down brands that were making you quite like lucrative offers um i think any most influencers have turned down a lot of brand deals but I think also I very much agree with the industry so I've been able to like I'd say 99.9% .9 of brand deals that I've accepted have been things that I'm extremely passionate about or use their products every day or whatever it might be and they absolutely at no point will, will be actually against my ethos but definitely at the beginning when I kind of didn't have a regular income stream and very much did need um, that to for example get me through uni then it was more of a looking at it and saying okay I haven't used this yet I'll try the product and if I like it so it wasn't kind of a, like I've used this for 10 years and I love it so I'm going to show mm -hmm. it to you um, but then also there is the fact that I was able to grow with that and also create my own non-reliant on brands income streams which meant that obviously that is a very fortunate position to be in to mean that I can I, I mean now I do but almost no brand deals at all um, because it doesn't really it wouldn't really make sense for me to but obviously mm -hmm. even in the in-between stage of that I was in a position where I could turn things down so I think that especially I obviously understand that a lot of people for example if we look at something like Love Island mm -hmm. um, might come out of there and obviously are promoting whatever they want to promote but actually there are, is another side to it in looking at, you know, well, did a man management agency come to them and essentially make them sign something that now means that they need to promote all of this and they're essentially being milked for their money for things that they don't want to do. Um, and so there are so many different sides to it. And I think you are essentially self-employed within the industry. And so you have to be quite savvy and quite um, detailed in the way you look into things. Whereas, obviously, some people might not think to do that and it might be a really exciting opportunity that comes along and they might end up signing away something in perpetuity or kind of end up um, you know having like problems with legal things that go on with a brand or whatever um, and so there are so many different sides to it that I think a lot of people who might be looking in don't necessarily see and obviously it's very quick to be able to judge something like that yeah. um, but yeah, I mean, there were, there were a lot of, I mean, a lot, a lot, a lot of brand deals that were turned down. And obviously I'd never accept one that wasn't against my kind of, uh, was against my kind of core ethos. Um, but I've also been very, very lucky to be in that position yeah. as well. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to hear that also because it's obviously such different relationships with like the power dynamics that exist there. Because if you're just fresh off Love Island and you don't really know what it's like, um, to, to be offered said brand deals, whereas you growing with the industry, it's such a different sort of platform and sort of growth path, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd never, I'd never even realized that Love Islanders get signed, like have <laughs> to sign off their um, brand deals. But um, moving to sort of your growth into a business, so I mean, first with the Grace Fit guys, and now obviously with Tala and BND. Um, so why did you decide to move your Instagram platform into a business when you're being offered these kind of deals, for example? Well, I think first things first, it's obviously great not to be reliant on other people um, for whether it's income or whatever it might be, any type of security. And I think it was at the point that I started seeing that 
this could be something that I'd like to turn into a job in some way, but mm. I didn't see the job as it stood as something that I'd want to do long term. So mm. I personally wouldn't want to be in the future putting my kind of family on social media and I didn't want to rely on that and kind of say, oh, well, I need to do this because it will be good for YouTube. Mm. Like that, to me, that wasn't something I wanted and I wanted to kind of formulate that into a sort of not really exit strategy because it's kind of like staying in but in a different way. Yeah. Um, but I very much wanted to look at different ways that I could do that and also being reliant on brand deals isn't the same as being reliant on a salary from a company. It's a lot more volatile and mm. there are so few rules about it because half the guidelines have only just been developed in the past year. So I really wanted to kind of move away from that even if it was just gradually um but I guess right at the beginning it was more just the fact that I was getting asked a lot for certain things like recipes or workout guides or just mm. my workouts or whatever it might be um and I kind of also needed money and I was like this would be great I could combine <laughs> these two together um and essentially make it a business but without at the beginning, I wasn't thinking, okay, what's the scalability in this? How do mm. I do this? Do I need to do this? Do I need to appoint this person? Um, it was very much just like, I have this knowledge. These people want it. Money. <laughs> Puts it together, and then you can create something that actually is something that you can rely on, and you should be being paid for either your knowledge or, like, if people don't want it, they won't buy it. Mm. Um, and so that was kind of the idea for me, was that I can't sit down at uni and spend a few weeks writing something yeah. um, in the same way as someone might spend a few weeks working somewhere in the holidays. Mm. I was in the holidays and I was kind of like, I could spend these three weeks making something that people might buy, people might not buy. Mm. Um, but whatever it is, is it's a bigger kind of, it's a time commitment. And mm. if people want that, then mm. I can give it to them. Yeah. And in terms of the move to Tala, Tala and BND in particular, I think it's like such a larger investment on your part. And I mean, you were talking about on Instagram, like these big reveals that were coming up and it was all very super exciting. Um, in terms of that, I feel like that's much more of a sort of conscious move to business as opposed to just being like, okay, well, this is something that might be interesting. So what do you think was that, what was this sort of like the process behind it? Because obviously it's a lot more different because you're talking about like scalability and you've obviously taken on a lot of sort of like business, you've taken on a large business role um, in doing so. Um, well, I guess one thing in addition to what I just said in terms of the fact that, you know, this could make money or whatever mm. it was, um, I have always been interested in kind of the business side of things and I knew that at some point I wanted to have a business mm. but I personally didn't think I'd be starting mm. that business I kind of wanted to get to a point in my career then maybe I could move to a startup or I could yeah. um you know hopefully get high up in some company and be able to make those decisions and that really excited me but I don't think it was ever kind of presented as an option where it was like okay well if that type of um you know being able to look at the big picture of things and actually decide the direction and strategy mm. um could you know, you could do that yourself, but you could also, you could, you could start it from the beginning. Um, and I think that became more and more apparent when I, I obviously started with kind of like recipe books and guides and then realized that people really loved them and realized that I really loved kind of thinking, okay, well, where, where can we get, go next? What can we give people that they also want? And then started looking at resistance bands and the way there was a gap in the market for well-priced ethical resistance bands. And then sort of taking that a step further and then maybe taking on my first person and then mm. wh whatever it might be. Um, and I think the thing with me that often makes me feel, it kind of gives me a lot of imposter syndrome is the fact that there was no point that I sort of sat down and was kind of thought, you know, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to become an entrepreneur and I'm going to do this. And in fact, I don't think even until the past few months, mm. I've started kind of classing myself as an entrepreneur. Mm. Um, and so it was very much a, well, this fits with this and this fits with this. Um, I could develop that and I could scale that. Um, but then I, about a year and a half ago, I, I really enjoyed wearing active wear and mm. kind of buying active wear and then I started becoming more aware of things like fast fashion and things like unethical production and the sustainability side of things um, and when I was looking at the industry for what I wanted it was either too expensive or it was very stereotypical in terms of what you'd think that 
that type of person would like to wear mm. um, and so then we kind of started piecing together bits and bits about Tala um, and then it, it kind of grew it started from an initial idea but I didn't know necessarily whether I'd stick with BND for it or mm. whether I'd start it somewhere else or whether I'd partner with someone whatever it might be um, and it kind of just grew and grew and I feel that's the thing with these ideas you think you'll come in with a big idea and it will turn into the business that it is but actually it kind of just snowballs it get, gathers all these ideas and you talk to someone and you think hey we could add that to the business or we could add this um, and then you end up with something that is what your business ends up being um, and for us that definitely came to light a lot through Tala. Um, yeah. It was kind of unrecognisable from its initial concept, apart from like the big pillars of the ethos. Yeah, and I think it's 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 interesting because it was obviously like in the making for months and months, um, and we only see the final product. But there was so much work that was put into it in terms of like the brainstorming process almost. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of a chance to do a sales pitch here, almost I feel like. But um, right. I think one thing that we're all really interested in is like. Um, in terms of the sustainability aspect of it, is how you make these products 100% sustainable. Because I think sort of in a world of fast fashion, it is just very difficult to, f to think of and like find ways in which things can be 100% sustainable. So in terms of Tala and BND, so how do you ensure that the clothes and the packaging are 100% yeah. sustainable? Well, first things first, I'd like to do an anti-sales pitch um, and <laughs> say that I don't think anything at any scale can be 100% sustainable. So even if, for example, if we are equating our sustainability in terms of our item composition to kind of that being 100% mm. sustainable. So for example, if I, you know, our track suits are made from plastic bottles and they are 100% recycled PET bottles, um, that doesn't I mean, it might be 100% sustainable, but then also if a company like Boohoo makes a tracksuit out of 100% recycled bottles, that mm. doesn't make them sustainable. Mm. And it might make someone a lot more sustainable than us if it's like a tiny business that only produces one a year. Mm. So I think that's very important to say because I would never want to claim to be 100% mm. sustainable in any way because also we're in this weird little bridge where we're providing something for people to be able to come from fast fashion to this, but they're still consuming. The yeah. most sustainable item you can have is the one you already own. And so I think that's a very important thing to bear in mind. Um, but for us, in terms of Tala, the idea was to find the most sustainable options that we could produce because if we decided to produce them on a smaller level then we wouldn't be providing that kind of mm. bridge that we wanted to be providing we wanted people to say okay i could buy this pair of leggings or i could buy this pair of leggings they're the same price mm. um and they're marketed the same way, but this one is made out of 100% recycled material, then people would choose that one and kind of say, you know, the people who made these weren't working in a sweatshop and were paid fair wages. Um, and so, whereas if we kind of took away from that completely and kind of said, okay, well, we're not going to market it to you because we don't want too many people buying them and we're not going to, um, you know, we're going to do all these things to essentially make it even more sustainable we would never be able to be a competitor to that brand yeah. so we would never ever be able to produce the solution that we currently do produce so for us one of the weirdest things was kind of working out how to be sustainable in a fast fashion way even though we're a slow mm. fashion company so we have to market like a a fast fashion company we have to kind of do everything like a fast fashion company apart from our production mm. and are kind of raising awareness and all of these things that we really want to push to the forefront. Um, so in terms of things like production, for example, even in the time that we've started producing our first samples, so probably about a year ago, the technology has come on so much that it means that it's not even comparable. So we're that much more sustainable because we are making money in a way that big money then pays an interest and invests. So, for mm. example, our factory partners have just received a $20 million investment into the production of sustainable materials. And that wouldn't, that wouldn't have happened if it was just because the person was interested in sustainability. I mean, it could yeah. have, but it's, very, it's much more unlikely than, for example, if they say, you know, we're having this many orders come in a day and we've got to produce those things. So, mm. you know, how about you take over this much of the factory? So... For us, that's been really important and kind of showing the big money that mm. we are selling and that people want this. It's just that where options have been there before, either they are there and people, you know, there are loads of company, amazing sustainable companies that are coming up doing really similar things mm. and we're doing similar things to them and all of that and that is absolutely fantastic. But kind of beyond that, 
we're creating something that means that people have to start listening because there doesn't just need to be one sustainable company. They need the same amount of choice as fast fashion people have. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, for us, it's just, it's just kind of come on leaps and bounds. The more people we've been able to talk to, the more, people, like, more other sustainable brands who would be in direct competition to us that we're kind of all sitting down and going, hey, how do we make this? And actually helping each other. Um, and I think that that's also one of the most beautiful things about this kind of sustainability space is that, you know, you're never truly sustainable unless you don't see the other competition as competition because yeah. we have to come on together because half the technology doesn't even exist yet. So that's been one of the really, really important things for us. Yeah, that's super interesting about the collaborative aspect of it as well, I think. Also because like, I would never imagine that happening in, in any sort of like, competitive space. Um, that's sort of like, heart, heartening as well to, to see that. Um, and in terms of the other thing that I found really sort of incredible about your branding um, was sort of the diversity and inclusivity in, in the campaigns. Um, and I think that, that was something that really made Tala and B&D both stick out. Um, so how have you made sure that diversity and inclusivity are sort of at the forefront of your campaigns and of all your marketing? Well, I think one of the biggest things for us has been kind of the shock at how much praise we've received for that because mm. that kind of just shows how awful it is yeah. the fact that one of the kind of one of the most common comments we get is kind of i love how diverse this is i love how inclusive this is and it's kind of that's amazing that's really great we're glad you appreciate it mm. but why is that so shocking why is that one of our most common comments why are people looking at that and finally being like okay well i feel included and it's not by any means that we're at all the first brand to do that yeah. but we've made sure that it is kind of in every stage of everything so whether it is asking people to try things and actually having focus groups surrounding products that might be for example that another company might make and just multiply the measurements rather than mm. actually look at how it different it fits on different body shapes and being able to work out how they can optimize that for people without just saying okay well if it's this size then say it's size then if i'm going to make it this size bigger then i just need to multiply it by that amount they haven't talked to the people they haven't actually got you know how, mm. how does this make you feel? How can you change this? Because actually, if you go from this body shape to this body shape, it's going to be a completely different fit. Mm. Um, and then kind of beyond that, just the whole, I mean, I feel the whole fitness industry as a whole has, has a lot of problems in terms of those yeah. issues. And the, one of the main things in our kind of, we started our first ever launch campaign with a kind of series of we are's um, mm. and kind of things like we are, high performance we are inclusive we are affordable whatever it might be um and the those were the things that we thought that at no point would we ever use as a marketing campaign mm -hmm. and it is sad that it can even be used as a marketing campaign because that just demonstrates how rare it is in itself mm -hmm. um and so I think one of the best things that can come out of it is we've actually seen a lot of kind of competing not sustainable brands kind of see it and think ah, well, this does well on social media too. So therefore, we will add a little bit of inclusivity um, into our posts or whatever it might be. Um, and so that's, I guess, a good thing that can come out of it. But actually, people don't want to listen mm -hmm. until it's someone with a big following who's white yeah. kind of saying, look at this, this is great, we do that. Um, and I think that's one of probably one of the most upsetting things about it. But it's nothing we're ever going to change, and it is at the core of our business. Yeah, and I think, yeah, definitely, there's a point about the way in which people respond to things when, when, when they're successful. I think, I can't even remember which brand this was, but I was reading an article about a brand that created like a diversity Instagram. Oh for yeah, it. I know exactly which brand that was. Yeah, I can't remember which brand it was like, for the life of me, but it was like a diversity Instagram where they yes. just had their clothes. It was my people who their brand and then white. inclusive. <laughs> and it, had, it, oh, it was the most <laughs> awful thing ever, but that's not even... I don't think that's even some of the worst stuff. I think because so, also that is so outright kind of just completely wrong and completely yeah. not thought through and also just completely you shouldn't have to think that through. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the biggest things there is that just demonstrates that even the kind of covert other side of the industry that is doing that without saying they're doing that um, yeah. should pay attention to that because as soon as these people labelled it in a completely, you know, stupid way, then people started paying attention, whereas that is happening every day in people's branding, and yeah. they don't pay attention because, or people do pay attention, but the brand doesn't, they don't listen to what people want, because it works for them, and the money is still going into their pockets. 
Yeah, um, I mean, I just found it interesting because I was like, so many people had to like take box, say yes to this decision, but like no one along the line was like, this is a bit weird, guys. Like, maybe we should do this. <laughs> um, so turning to, um, you made a, a comment earlier about the fitness industry and kind of about, you know, like the, the problems that the fitness industry has with diversity and inclusion. I think it spreads to a lot of industries, but mm -hmm. obviously the fitness industry is what, what you know very well. Mm -hmm. um, so a question that I think is very interesting for anyone who's been involved in Instagram and, and it has been an influencer is how do you approach the fitness industry and Instagram as a feminist? And, and do you think... There's sort of a sort of contrast there between the two and the, that you have to sort of reconcile. I think if you say that there is a contrast between any industry and mm. feminism, mm. it kind of automatically makes it a sort of barrier to entry mm. because there should be no, I guess, feminism in its core and in its essence is something that should be applicable to every industry in the way that it believes that it is right. Mm. So by if you apply that to the industry and say you know you're not a feminist if you're posting photos in a bikini um i guess obviously you can get into the whole arguments of <laughs> the waves of feminism and whatever it might be but actually i think one of the biggest things is that i am a woman and mm -hmm. i am a feminist and i am sitting here doing what I want um, mm -hmm. and being unapologetic about it and therefore I feel that in the same way as anything can be mm. a feminist or whatever type of act you want it to be um, by just doing what you want to do and not letting for example the stereotypes that then may come to the fact that I then go and sit in an investment meeting after uploading a photo in a bikini that morning just like hey guys <laughs> good morning um, and kind of the idea that you can also I guess that in myself, I, I originally thought very much, I was saying this the other day, um, that I kind of looked at those things and I thought, you know, maybe I need to come across a different way because I'm now trying to transition more into fulfilling my role as an entrepreneur rather than an influencer and I need to do this and I need to wear a pantsuit and I need to do whatever I might need to do to be taken seriously and then I guess in the space of a few months the transition from that and being like actually I will maybe turn up in heels with nails and mm. a pink hairband because that's like if you don't take me seriously then I'm afraid that's your issue and yeah. we can see how that works for you um, and I guess that's just been one of the biggest things for me is just understanding that in any way the best way you can do things is the way you want to do things as long as you're not you know, hurting other people. Um, and as long as you're trying to change yourself to fit in against what people might expect or might be their kind of cookie cutter idea of what they want, um, you're just doing a disservice to yourself. And so mm. I think that's been one of the biggest things for me is just being like, well, I can try and hide as much as possible and try and fit into this shape that I'm made to be fit in. But actually, I'm going to do better and be truer to myself if I am just myself. Um, and take that to the boardroom and see how it goes for me. <laughs> and then maybe we'll change it if I need to. <laughs> but no, but yeah, I, I do believe that's, that's kind of really important. Yeah, and I think also there's, there's like a plethora of arguments I think that are made about like feminism and Instagram, and Instagram and the influencer industry. Um, but I think there is something sort of like fundamentally almost like anti-feminist about looking at this industry that is quite like female dominated and being like, oh, this is really delegitimate and like I don't understand how people are making money off this. I think it's sort of like the attitude that a lot of people have towards it does sort of underlying it is sort of sexism absolutely um uh turning to veganism so i think this is something that's really interesting in the sense that i was looking at statistics about a sort of the rise of veganism and vegetarianism in the past decade and it's been like astronomical um obviously this is something that you sort of spoke out about when you first turned vegan and you're like oh guys you know this is a big change in my life um so do you think there's a reason for people becoming more vegan and more vegetarian aside from like the obvious ethical one um yeah i mean absolutely i think i it's such a big topic to talk about because i do believe as well it changes by the day and by the week and by um you know mm. kind of minuscule amounts of times um and i think that probably when I talked about it a year ago, um, for example, I did that kind of BBC Politics Live and I talked about veganism and I talked about, you know, if it's a trend, then so what? It's mm -hmm. a trend that's good for the environment and um, it, 
you know, it's doing good things. So, you know, people can continue doing their fashionable trend because we like a great trend. Um, but actually, I think that's still so applicable. Um, and I think that obviously there are the ideas of ethics and um, climate change and whatever you might be able to kind of fit into the whole um, ethos of it. But actually, I feel like the argument is different for everybody. Um, and I, for, for one very much now am um, an environmental vegan, mm. I'd say. Um, but actually, when I initially went vegan, I went vegan because my friend had a parasite in her stomach and she couldn't eat any animal products, and I said I wouldn't eat them too with her. So it wasn't necessarily a hugely moral decision. It was me kind of saying, yeah, I'll do this with you. And then I kind of started reading books into it and just never went back. I, I just mm. made that decision one day, never had my last cheeseburger, never did what I wanted to do. Um, but, and then it kind of it just stuck with me and became something that I actually really, really believed in. So I, I can't sit here and say everyone's gone vegan because of the climate crisis or everyone's gone vegan because it's immoral or what, whatever you might want to say about it because I originally went vegan because of a parasite so that I didn't even have um, and now I will be the person fighting the corner of the kind of climate argument. Yeah. Um, so I think what's the, I guess the best thing about it is that there are so many different reasons for mm. it um, and I guess whatever your reason is will be the thing that makes you either stick to it the most or most passionate about it um, even if that's passionate about the idea that you can do your bit and you might class yourself as vegan and have dairy on occasion or whatever mm. it might be um, and that is the thing that is going to pull you back rather than seeing it as a kind of diet or whatever mm. you might see yeah I think there's also been like a, a rise in sort of like the flexitarianism almost like of being like oh I'm a vegan but occasionally my friend's like oh I'm a vegan but I have chocolate croissants yeah on occasion which is my know, friend calls herself a vegan because she eats eggs um which inventive you know 10 yeah. points for creativity um but I think actually one of the most important things is that if you believe in any of the reasons to go vegan, you will also believe in the fact that those are not cancelled out by either a mistake or an intentional decision mm, to yeah. stray from veganism. Because also there are so many different ways that people can class themselves as vegan. Um, and I think that it's the idea of labelling and that kind of rhetoric that it's all or nothing and you have to do this and you have to do that otherwise you're not in the in club that's doing this um is just so harmful and in the end does a lot more harm than good in the industry i mean i get ripped to shreds the whole time if i'm wearing a second-hand piece of leather um and i personally don't think that's you know good for the mm. argument but for some people that is what they are there to say so mm. I, I personally very much believe in just encouraging people to do their bit and do what they can because yeah. three years ago if you told me to go vegan I would have laughed at you um, and now I am and would be avidly kind of <laughs> protesting for it um, but yeah so I think it's important to stay very open-minded and to stay kind of aware of the fact that you can be vegan or have a sort of vegan awareness mindset without sticking to what everyone says you should be doing yeah yeah i definitely agree um i think i have gone overboard with my moderating and i haven't left much time for questions from the audience which i apologize for i was actually getting really into our conversation and <laughs> completely missed the time um but i want to open up to the floor for some questions now uh so yeah should we start with the keen hand in the in the corner <laughs> Is this on? It'll turn on, yeah. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, your business obviously grew so quickly, um, and Tala's, you know, only been around for what, six months, and still, oh, there, there's my voice, um, <laughs> and uh, is so huge. At what point, or have you yet, like, did you decide to bring in external expertise, or has it been like a learning on the job kind of situation, or did you do all your research in the year before, like? obviously going straight from uni to having this massive brand is such a big step and big learning curve. What was the hardest growing pain and did you bring in external people? Um, I definitely wasn't learning in a year up to it. Um, otherwise, the entirety of Tala would be based on a music degree. Um, but, and also, it was launched the month before my finals. So there was not that much space for intense research in a way that I probably would have liked to do and potentially should have done. Um, but actually, 
I think what that made me do was kind of take information from all areas. So I was able to kind of talk to people, to read books, to essentially take everything in and being able to build the business as it is. Um, and I think also one of the biggest things that kind of helped in terms of learning was the fact that there was a kind of year-long gestation period of the business. Um, it wasn't started in January and then launched in May. It was actually originally meant to have three different launch dates that then led up to May and that was because I didn't want to launch it until we got to kind of the core of what we wanted to be. Um, I still haven't brought in any external kind of advisory help. We don't have an advisory board. We are almost entirely made of kind of four women in their 20s. Um, but aside from that, we I mean, I go to roundtable meetings, I watch a lot of YouTube, I read a lot, I read articles, um, and it's been a kind of, I think one of the biggest things for me has been learning that firstly, I can take things from traditional businesses and apply them to my business, but also that I can't think too seriously about the idea that you know I needed to go to business school or I needed to learn specific things that apply to a business and I unless I've done that module I can't take on new staff or I can't get investment um, and actually play to the idea that this is an, a very very new industry whether it's the sustainability side or the kind of active wear side to the amount active wear is now um, looked at and purchased and I guess like a fashion industry in itself um, and being able to look at that and being able to take little pieces from everywhere has been so useful for me. And I think from now, um, I do sort of feel like I've, we've got to this point and now I'm sort of working backwards. So now I'm like, I need a mentor um, and I need to do this and I need to do that. And um, so whilst there has been so much that I kind of learnt from the fact that I clearly wanted to create this business because there were all these issues that I kind of saw were happening within the fitness industry, but um, also kind of beyond that and just a general interest in business and active wear and clothes. Um, and that kind of amalgamated into what Tala is. Um, but I think also just listening to people and listening to people say, well, surely that won't work because of this, or surely that will never be able to kind of play against this company. Um, and then just taking little snippets of information and feedback from everywhere. And hopefully in a year, Tala will be 10 times greater than it is today. So it's just all about that kind of constant learning process, um, which I think if I had had more kind of official learning, I wouldn't necessarily have looked at as much. Take another question. Um, so I noticed that um, you regularly use your platform to advocate for a range of issues, most recently encouraging young people to vote in the general election. However, I was surprised like how few influencers um, use their platform to do this. Um, so I wanted to ask, do you think it's unfair of me to criticise influencers for not using their platform in this way? Or do you think it's selfish of influences to like not encourage young people to vote in fear of like coming across controversial or over political, especially when their audiences are so young and the young people's vote is more important than ever? Um, I think it's that's a very very good question and one I think about a lot. I've been through a lot of different phases of kind of like, oh, you do you. I'm going to talk about this, but you don't need to. And then also being like, why on earth would you sit there with this much just because you want a brand deal and you can't talk about? And I know that I've missed out on so many brand deals because I've kind of been like, go and vote in the abortion referendum or whatever it might be. Um, and so, I think my current stance on it is. I think that there is a lot to be said for being an influencer or being in a posi position of kind of any power, whether it's like micro-influence within a society or whatever it might be, it, talking about things that are important and that you're passionate about. And I think that I can't also sit here and say, you know, I think it's incredibly selfish that these people don't talk about this, this and this, when I have my own streams of income that I, you know, rely on and I'm able to, and obviously people buy from those and they could stop buying from them or whatever it might be. But you know, I don't rely on brands for income and I do think that that, and before I d didn't do that, I still 
was kind of outspoken about these things, but that was very much my decision. And I was also at a point where I was at uni, I could still get my student loan, I could still, you know, maintain myself, and I could still do that job if I wanted to, even if, for example, I had a few months of not getting any brand deals or whatever it might be. So... I think we've seen a lot of examples of people being kicked off campaigns or losing out on things completely unjustly for, to, for talking about things that are important to be talked about. Um, and I think it's a dangerous zone for me to sit here and also say, you know, this person should be talking about this, whereas I sit here and I go to work every day at my own company um, and obviously have the benefits of that. But I do think it's incredibly important to also talk about these things, even if you talk about them in an impartial way. I mean, telling people to go out and vote is not that political it's literally i mean you're not telling anyone anything apart from you know the awareness of the fact that you have this democratic right and you should be exercising it um so yeah i think it's a very very kind of loaded argument but one that i give a lot of thought to and do try and do my best in um even if it's lost me some money <laughs> there Um, first of all, thank you for coming to talk to us and I just wanted to echo what you said about using your platform to stand up for social justice issues, particularly because you tweeted a few of my tweets about um, a refugee t-shirt campaign and we got like more donations because of it, so oh, thank so you. Um, my actual question is, in this sort of rise of a focus on the girl boss to the extent that a lot of young women kind of feel the need to work to the point of burnout or to the point where they don't allow margins for their own well-being. Like, what do you do to avoid that? Well, that's a very good question. I just heard my dad laugh, which I think means I don't. Um, but I do think it is... I think this whole culture, and forgive me for taking it beyond the kind of girl boss realm, I think the entirety of Instagram entrepreneurship and and glamorizing the idea of kind of working for yourself and being able to, you know, work 20 hours a day and make however much a day or whatever it might be is incredibly harmful. And I don't think I'm the right person to talk about how not to do that because I don't think it's necessarily this kind of social media side of things that is, has encouraged me into that. I've just always been very good at not looking after myself and working. Um, and, but I do, I do absolutely, and I want to talk about it more and more and more. Um, as one of the things I address, I did a video recently about the fact that I kind of just sat down and thought, like, all I do is work. And it's, it's because also it's such a glorified thing, and I'm always kind of rewarded for it. It's always people saying, like, your work ethic is great, all of this is great, great. and it's like... Well, Yes, but also I actually have no kind of self-awareness when it comes to looking after myself, um, apart from the occasional face mask, and that's not enough. Um, and so I think this whole glamorization of all work, no play, but also in 20 years you'll be on a jet ski and who's unhappy on a jet ski um, is, is just <laughs> harmful. Um, but... Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think it's harmful, and I think that um, a lot of people do have to work really, really, really hard, and a lot of the time it's not for all this reward that social media is going on about. Um, and I think that one of the most important things then to keep across all of that is just the idea that, you know, you can take it step by step, and you need to be able to incorporate wellness, not just into your kind of self-care regime, but also into your treatment of work and your treatment of yourself in relation to productivity. Because I know for a lot of, a lot of my life, my kind of self-worth has been related to my productivity, which isn't good at all. And I'm sure a lot of people in the room feel the same, because I know it's the same at Oxford. <laughs> um, um, but kind of this idea that actually if you haven't done this, this, and this, and this, and because you're seeing all these people around you doing ten times more than, you know, what you perceive you do, um, it is the kind of idea that it's never good enough and you always need to work more and you're never doing enough. Um, and I think that as soon as you become kind of happy and settled in, even if it is, you know, from time to time you're working that much more or you're doing that much more. I was kind of constantly just saying to myself, 
you know, it's because we've got this coming up and we've got this coming up and we've got this coming up. And it was like, wait a second, we literally release something every week. So I don't know how I can keep applying in, at this stage. This is my routine. Um, so, yeah, I'm probably not the best person to speak to about it, apart from the fact that I've become very aware. Um, and I do think it needs to be something that is looked at more and the self-care realm beyond the idea of just, you know, having a night in from time to time. Mm. Round up there. Hi. So um, obviously you spoke about kind of veganism being a trend and how that um, is good because it's getting more people into it and it's obviously really good for the environment. But I do think that there's kind of a backlash of that in that I think a lot of people are aware of like the negative effects of palm oil. But then obviously you've got like big trendy things like avocados and coconut oil that are now like being mass produced and for, like rainforests destroyed in order to create these farms. Do you think that there's like um, a solution or a way to kind of capitalise on the trend of veganism without the backlash or a way to move forward from that? Absolutely. I mean, I don't believe that I kind of have all the stats in terms of being able to be like, okay, well, it's helped this much, but it's hindered this much. Therefore, there is this much of a positive trend or whatever it might be. I think that we... In anything you do, you need to be mindful, and that includes trends that appear to be good for something, whether it's in the environment or people or whatever it might be. I know, obviously, a lot of, for example, things like quinoa and avocados that have become incredibly fashionable and part of this trend um, are, you know, farmed and held a lot of the time by indigenous people, and therefore, if we're going to start mass producing it um, because it's now trendy and we actually didn't care about these people until they could make us money, then we're causing a problem. Um, and I think in that way, you can be, you have to be mindful about everything you're doing, um, and it falls on the duty of the person and also someone like me um, to be able to say, hey, actually, you know, this is causing a problem or whatever. Um, I think as a whole it also then becomes very difficult because it's kind of saying, oh, you need to do this, you need to do this, but you can't do this, and you also can't do this. Um, but I do think the overall... I think the kind of trend of veganism, one thing that is potentially less good is the idea that there are now fashionable foods. I mean, any trend or anything not in moderation can cause issues and does cause issues. Um, and I think one of the biggest things has been that there have been people who are vegan or dairy intolerant or whatever it might be for forever um, and our way of taking it now is in a very kind of consumeristic capitalistic way of being like well you've got all of these kind of products that you can buy that aren't that maybe aren't sustainable but they're still not using animal products um, and whereas at the core veganism was just not using animal products so it might have been having a like highly rice and vegetable and kind of pulses based diet um whereas obviously now for a lot of people it's not um so yeah i feel like there will always be problems with everything but all you can do is your best and genuinely your best in researching i mean i know that for example when i originally found out that avocados used as much water as it does to kind of produce beef i was like Yes, but I like an avocado. Um, and then it kind of took a while, and then I was like, okay, well, mushrooms are nice too. Um, and then was able to kind of pay a bit more attention to that. So I think it's just all being able to research and check your facts and then being able to come to your own conclusion um, based on the fact that being vegan is not the same for everyone and it doesn't mean this, eating the same foods every day just as being an omnivore doesn't mean eating the food, the same foods every day. Um, but yeah, of course, there are huge problems with it. Okay, so I'm going to round off with the last question that I try to ask everyone, um, which I feel like, I don't know, maybe you'll give a different answer in five years' time. Um, like it's quite like cheesy. Like, What would you give as advice for your university self, which I feel like is a bit premature at this stage, but I don't know whether <laughs> you agree with me. Yes, um, I mean... My university self was about four months ago. Yes. Um, so um, I'd probably... I think it's very difficult because my entire time at university, I was kind of thinking, can I even make it to the end? I don't know if I can do this and graduate with my degree. I don't know if it's going to have to be something I put on hold or if I ever put it, if I put it on hold, will I ever come back to it? Or, you know, maybe this just isn't for me. Maybe I've already got my career or whatever it might be um and I think 
the way I did it was very much just like day by day and it wasn't ever a conscious thing like okay now I'm committing to it I'm gonna do it I nearly dropped out about three times in first year um and that was before any of this stuff kind of took Mm. off um and so I think generally to my university self it would just be like continue not overthinking because just do it day by day and you'll actually be at the end and you'll be like my god like I can't believe I've got to this point and I just remember on my last day of finals just Mm. being like huh (laughs) so that's that then um and I remember also saying before I got to the end of finals like once I have done my finals and when I'm out of university I'm never going to complain again I'm going to be the happiest person in the world because I'll just be able to work on my businesses I'm not going to have to have this alongside and then I complain every day so um (laughs) My advice would probably be stop thinking that you're going to stop complaining after university. Your time feels like liquid and therefore you will be even busier beyond it. Um, But also just enjoy the ride because I do think that there were certain points that I very much got and obviously it was good to get wrapped up in it because Mm. it's ended up, you know, leading to great success. But also just being able to kind of take things slow and understand that it is not always about you know, the, the thing you perceive to be the most important thing um, mm. that week, um, there is always a bigger picture. Um, and I think that kind of really helped me when I was there. But also what really helped me was literally just not thinking about it and being like, well, I could stress about this now, but I have an essay due tomorrow. So I'll have to stress about it after the essay when I'll be <laughs> stressing about something else. So it's kind of all just like procrastinated stress um, and then ending up just being like, woo, degree. <laughs> So um, lots of advice, probably none of it would have changed how I did my university experience because I know the way I did my university experience was so grace that there could not have been another way I did it. Yeah, I think all of us were probably just like opening a business a month before finals just sounds like... Don't do it. Yeah. Like honestly, actually, if that's one advice I could give to everyone else's university self is just don't do it. Um, And, you know, everything can wait and usually something does go wrong and opening two businesses a month before finals just needs to stop. Um, And, yeah, just (laughs) that's all the advice I can give. (laughs) Yeah, honestly, like, yeah, as a finalist now, I'm just like, God, what? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I'm going to round off now. Uh, Thank you so much, obviously, for coming up to visit us. Um, It was really lovely of you, and it was really lovely having you here to have very important discussions about a variety of things. Um, I'm sure I can speak for everyone in the audience when we say we're very thankful. Um, Thank you also to our AV team for um, making this event logistically possible, and also thank you to our stewards tonight who have been passing around the mics. Um, I have a couple of announcements read the union um so tomorrow we will be having a panel on faith and fashion some very interesting speakers coming in to talk about that um on wednesday we have a panel on the british green new deal and on thursday we have our last debate of term which is on this house believes men cannot be feminists um i will be speaking on that unfortunately for everyone who's there um and our last event for tonight is actually uh, at 9:30. Uh, we have a woman and non-binary spoken word tonight, spoken word night, which will be in the garden room, which is just outside. If you turn to the right, um, so I hope to see some of you there. Um, so again, thank you so much. Um, can you guys please remain in your seats while we exit? Uh, obviously, excluding your family. But um, yeah, have a good evening. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.